here we go. Got it all cleared off, about to start prepping this. Randy has to take the sink out though. We're getting a new sink. Exciting. All right, first job was to cover up the floors. And we've got uh, drop paws down and then rolled out ram board. Took the upper drawers, doors that went all the way up, out. Because the next thing is to tape plastic all the way around. And Randy went all the way down the hall. So it's easy to track this stuff, we've discovered. Prep is everything. Well, it's been a bit of a day, but we got the sink out and there's a few places where we have a little bit of a gap where my overlay i had to chip it out it was loose so we've got to bondo that luckily this side over here I sanded a little bit oh i mean it doesn't have any more top coat i was worried that this was really wet but it's not i can't even chip it up so that's good but You might be wondering what that is. And over here, what this is. See, when I designed this kitchen, I wanted these little indentation things here where I have towels. Well, the new sink was catching on the edge here. So we pulled back this thin beadboard separated it back <clears throat> and Randy started cutting just a little bit. We thought we were gonna have to cut a whole lot, but we didn't. He just chipped a little bit of it out and then we put the beadboard back and trimmed that and the sink fits and I have no hole. Happy for that. I'll need to repaint those, but they need it anyway. On to Bondo. Then sanding, no, then plastic up everywhere, then sanding. Now you can use alcohol to clean off the dust. I didn't have any so I used acetone and I went over it two or three times to make sure all of the dust was off of the countertop before starting the next step. XIM bonding primer is the next step. Now the reason I am using bonding primer on a concrete surface that's really porous is twofold. Number one, the top coat that I had on um, the concrete overlay didn't get all sanded off. And number two, in some little places on the edge, uh, we had a few little divots where the tile, the original tile, showed through. And that is not porous, so the bonding primer was necessary. Now that bonding primer rolls on very thinly. So my next coat is going to be the stone coat epoxy uh, undercoat in white. And uh, you might have noticed there that I used some masking tape to get the fibers off of my roller. I used a foam brush up next to the edges and then a roller everywhere else. This coat also goes on very thinly 
it dried in about two hours. Uh, it was still a little tacky, but at that point you can go ahead and roll on your second coat without having to sand. So after my first coat, I just wrapped my roller sleeve in some um, clean saran wrap. Uh, that way I didn't have to try to clean it or use a new roller sleeve for the second step. And that's going to be the end of day one's prep after the second coat. We've let everything dry for 24 hours and the next step is going to be to lightly sand with a 220 grit. We just want to have a little bit of tooth for the epoxy um, to bond to and after we sand then we want to clean it, get the dust off. To use that you can use alcohol. Um, isopropyl alcohol if you can get 91 percent that's the best and then if you can't you can use acetone so that's what we'll be using is acetone it evaporates dries very quickly the other thing you need to make sure of is your temperature in your space it needs to be above 70 degrees they say about 72 is the best so this morning we don't like a hot house this morning I turned up the heat and so it's it's warm in here and we will have to keep that temperature all night for it to cure properly and then tomorrow when we do the flood coat same thing got to keep it warm in the house now I want to talk just a minute about making your sample board and then making sure you can match it it's a really good idea to record yourself while you're making your sample board and talk out loud about the steps that you are doing. That's what I did when, well, on all five samples that I did, I recorded, then got rid of the ones that I didn't like the sample. But the sample that we did like, uh, I went back and re-watched that and I took notes. I took explicit notes about everything that I had done so uh, in fact you can see that it was uh, video kitchen remodel part two was my sample now uh, when we get to the mixing portion I mean I don't know that you have to be this specific maybe it won't matter to you but I want everything to match as closely as possible so, for example, the epoxy colors that I'm using in the epoxy, um, parchment dye, white dye, almond spray paint, a mixture of parchment and brown dye to make kind of a caramely taupe color, um, pearl and white mica powder mixed, straight brown dye, and pewter mica powder. And when I did that, I had decided I wanted only percentages of these things. 40% is parchment, 20% is white, 15% is my caramely mix, 15% is the almond spray paint, 5% is the pearl white, 2.5% is the brown dye, and 2.5% is the pewter. So I got really, really specific on that. From there, then I could calculate, for example, with what we're about to pour, I need 150 ounces mixed up. That's a little over four and a half quarts. I'll be mixing five quarts because I need some extra epoxy to put down first, which I'll show you when we get to that point. But 40% of 150 ounces is 60 ounces. So when I'm ready to do that, I've got my cups out so that I can pour exactly that amount. You'll see also that when I start layering them in my buckets for the dirty pour, in between the epoxies, I put spray paints. Well, I went back to my video again and I counted the number of sprays 
that I had used in the eight ounces of sample. And then I extrapolated that to know how to do it here. So the next step is to sand with 220 grit sandpaper. Randy is uh, taping up some plastic inside our sinkhole so that epoxy won't mess up our uh, cabinet below. And now I am cleaning, cleaning, cleaning with the denatured alcohol. What I'm doing now is taping a dam on the corner edges of the countertop because we are doing a dirty pour. We want that epoxy to stay on top of the counter and not run off right away. We want to give it time to move and then we can also move it with uh, the heat gun or the propane torch. But this purple tape is the delicate tape, but it's still not that delicate. So as I'm taping this on, I'm taking some of the sticky off using my body, my shirt, my jeans, whatever I have. The other thing about taping is that you really want to have it all in uh, one piece. Makes it uh, better for pulling it later and you don't have multiple pieces. Now we have, uh, I guess it's called a on top of the counter mount sink versus an under counter mount sink. So this will be very easy to tape and I won't have to pull the tape. Um, I'll just leave it there and it's already be already ready for the flood coat that will happen tomorrow. And then once that dries, we'll just take a razor knife and cut the tape away. I'm also going to take some strips and fold them over so that I don't have the sticky part exposed. Just make it easier to work around. As I said, I need to mix five quarts. Now, even though this says it's a five quart bucket, the measurements only go to um, four quarts right here, and I don't want to guess getting it to the next stage. Plus, it would just be too full. So I'm gonna mix three quarts in one and two quarts in another bucket. And I like to use the buckets that have the labeling there for you, because that makes it easy. Part A is the resin, part B is the hardener. Part A is thick, part B is much thinner. You wanna put part B in your buckets first. So, oh, wear gloves, very important. If you're not 60 years old like me, or if you have perfect eyesight, you might not need to do this. But I find it helpful because even reading through a clear bucket, it's hard for me to see. So I'm making it darker. There's three quarts, which is 96 ounces. And I need to know half of that, 48 ounces. You mix this equally in a one-to-one -one ratio. This bucket, here's two quarts. Half of 64 is 32. Now I can see much better.
this product, Stone Coat Epoxy, is no VOC and it is food grade. When you mix it, you need to have a paddle beater like this. And you also need to have an empty spare bucket uh, to set your drill down when you're through mixing so it can just naturally just drip off straight up. You can see I've got epoxy bubbles all over this, epoxy little things. That's fine, it actually helps mix it better. All right, when you start, you want to go all the way to the bottom of your bucket, and then we're gonna pull up and mix. I need to mix for two minutes. And somewhere in that time, I will slow down the drill and go around the bottom and the sides. I don't wanna do that at high speed because this is a plastic bucket and I don't want little plastic shards in the epoxy. Randy, I'm gonna put this on the floor for you to mix this one so I can start pouring in my cups. Mm -hmm. First up is the pewter mica powder. Can you find my uh, mask? Pewter mica powder. You want to work on mixing that one really well. Brown dye. I don't know. This gets. This is my mix. I'm gonna go ahead and squirt. Too. Takes very little of these dyes. They are very concentrated. When I made my sample, I meant to just use pearl and I grabbed the wrong bag and put white in. So then I added pearl to the same cup. I might have not used the white if I had had more epoxy, but I didn't have any, enough epoxy to make anymore. So, just mixing the white and the pearl together. I'm let you mix this one now. It takes a bit of stirring to get those mica powders mixed. Next up is parchment in these two buckets. And also, these little extra cups over here are for my flood coat. Not my flood coat, but my first coat to kind of get an epoxy down on it. Now, I want this to be pretty opaque. And the way to tell how opaque it is is by using these popsicle sticks. And if you can see the grain through it, then you know it's fairly translucent. That looks good. May have to add some more of these. You have a lot of open time, working time, with their regular two-part epoxy. They make an, another kind that you only have about 45 minutes. To work I believe but you got you got a lot of time with this I want this white to be opaque as well and it wasn't so I'm adding a little bit more dye still needs more I can see the writing through the stick I think that's better and this is my mix it's kind of a I don't know Topi or caramel.
and this is parchment and a little bit of brown dye. And my last color is spray paint, almond. Now when you mix spray paint in the epoxy, you're never going to get it opaque. And you don't want to use too much spray paint because it makes your epoxy really runny. So this is going to be a more transparent mix. All right, these are going to be my dirty buckets. I like working with the smaller buckets for a couple of reasons. One, it's just easier for me to hold and pour. And secondly, uh, I don't know for a fact, but if you were to mix it all in a great big bucket, I maybe the uh, marbling might be wider or something, I don't know. So, I'm using five smaller buckets. So, my first thing is almond. Would you mind handing me the cans as Now, parchment. Now, I have 60 ounces of parchment, and this parchment is going to be layered six times in each of the five cups. So, in each pour, I'm going to be just pouring about two ounces in each cup, roughly. Number three is clear matte. Now you're usually not supposed to use matte uh, spray paints, only Rust-Oleum and only satin to gloss, but the clear matte in a dirty pour does give some cool effects. Now the white. I have 30 ounces of white and it will be layered four times in my cups. So I'm going to pour around an ounce and a half out. Warm gold. Next is my, I don't know, taupey mix. I have 22 and a half ounces. It will be layered three times. So that's about an ounce and a half again of this one. White hammered spray paint. Don't use a lot of this. White hammered. I did do eight. Next is my almond spray paint that's in epoxy. I have 22 and a half ounces of it, and it goes in four layers. So, a little over an ounce in each cup. Uh, I didn't do a spray paint. Let's see, where am I? Almond. Yes, I did. Warm gold. I don't want to touch the caps. I'm a little sticky. Now my brown dye. I only have um, 3.75 ounces of my brown dye, and I only poured, uh, layered it twice, so I'm going to use about half of this, spread out over the five cups. 
I didn't do um, a spray paint. Next, I did pewter. And pewter, I also have the same amount measurement as the brown dye, and I'm only layering it twice. So I will spread the pewter out. Well, that should give you a general idea of the layering process. For the complete recipe, you can go to the video where I make the sample and I give you every exact step. All right, um, we've turned over the buckets onto the countertop because what we want to do is basically grease our countertop. So we're using the epoxy that I, the extra that I mixed up, plus all of those out of cups, and just greasing the surface using the popsicle stick. And Randy heated it with a torch as well. All right, at this point, we've got it coated and we're ready to do our dirty pour with our five cups. But uh, when you dirty pour, it's, it's good to kind of run off the edge off, back on, off, back on. And so a lot of it falls on the floor and we want to save as much as we can to come back uh, and fill in places, especially on the edges once we pull our tape. So Randy, what he did was uh, he uh, pulled the bucket and kind of follows me around and looking at my bar top, I really want to be deliberate in pouring like it looks like an extension in, in kind of the same directions. So, I'm going to start here. retaping um, our edges here using the blue tape for the tile. We, we actually could have also used uh, masking tape because it wouldn't hurt the tile. But for the cabinetry, we want to use the purple delicate tape. All right, to give it two, um, we have to sand again using the 220 grit pads. And I like to just use this uh, hand sander, especially on my edges, because I don't want to burn through the epoxy. You could use the uh, the battery powered 
rotary thing. But this is just as easy. And again, clean all the dust off really well with alcohol or acetone. The next step is the flood coat. The reason to do the flood coat, two things. Number one, it's extra protection. And it fills in, uh, if you have any little dips or divots, it, it fills that in. Secondly, your clear flood coat is what is going to make the product food grade. Because when you mix paints, especially, you know, like spray paint, um, with the epoxy, that's not food grade. So we need the clear coat on top. I'll be using this notched edged trowel. As you can see, I've already used it once on the bar. You can get these at Stone Coat. I like them. Um, you can get eighth inch trowels other places, but I like this because of the way they constructed it. You set it down on its little edge there and all of your epoxy flows away from the teeth and then it's easily reusable. You also need a little chop brush. I got this from them too. I like it, it's angled. You're only gonna use this once and throw it away. It's too much trouble to try to clean them. But sometimes they lose their hairs so it's a good idea to try to pull out, de-hair any, um, and watch it when you're chopping. Um, we use the chop brush to get rid of the trowel lines. That brings up air, so then you're going to have to use a heat gun or your propane torch to torch out all the bubbles and get a beautifully level, smooth finish. But what I was gonna say is when I was doing the chopping, I had two hairs come off in the in the epoxy, and of course I saw them immediately. It's nice that they're black because it's easy to see that way on our light finish. So for the flood coat, you want three ounces per square foot. Actually, I'm going to mix all the rest that I have because I think we're gonna be really close. Remember, you're gonna use the hardener first Looks like I got 32 ounces, and when I remeasured my square feet this morning, I came up with uh, needing 57 ounces, and I was rounding up to 60, so I think we'll be fine. Randy is using the chop brush to get my trowel marks out. And now I'm using the heat gun to remove air bubbles. Later on, Randy also used the torch. It's a little faster. You need to remove the air bubbles three or four times within the first few hours least the first hour uh, make sure you're checking several times I'm tapping with my finger to release surface tension and Randy uses his chop brush and some extra material to put a little bit more on those narrow edges still got some bubbles I've used the heat gun twice. Um, I'm gonna pull the tape now, and then Randy's gonna use the blowtorch. Should get the rest of the little things out. Can't do this with tape on.
You have to get these drips off the edge. You can use a stick, you can use a gloved finger. We made the decision that we wanted our marble to look honed and have a duller versus the shiny finish. So the first step in that process was to sand the top coat pretty well uh, and especially any areas where there were uh, little bobbles, little divots. There were a few very, very tiny ones. So I sanded it very smoothly and then of course clean again with acetone. We also decided to use the ultimate top coat to get this honed finish for a number of reasons. Cure time for one, it shortens the whole process to about seven days. And it the durability, it really adds a lot of scratch resistance to the top of your countertop. So, we mixed according to directions and applied using one wet roller and three dry rollers.